Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of the Let's Get Engaged podcast. I'm here today with Anne Steptoe from MedServe. Their mission is to improve the health of the medically underserved communities of North Carolina, while exposing tomorrow's most promising future providers to primary care practice in a way that inspires them to be lifelong champions of health equity. Anne is the executive director of the organization. She grew up in a small town in West Virginia before she went on to attend Harvard College. And then after college, she spent two years in healthcare services and delivery research at the Massachusetts General Hospital with a focus on physician workforce issues. She is here today to tell us all about the phenomenal work that the current MedServe fellows are doing and how they are demonstrating incredible leadership during the pandemic. So, welcome to our guest today, Anne Steptoe from MedServe. I really love the MedServe mission statement. So, what it states for you all is catalyzing community transformation through primary care. So, Anne is here today from MedServe to talk to us a little bit about what they do. So, Anne, uh, you guys have a phenomenal group of fellows. Um, What kind of work are you guys doing over there? Yeah, of course, um, Morgan, thanks so much for having me me and I always love to talk about what MedServe is, is doing and, and a little bit about our programming. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. The way that I uh, describe MedServe to a lot of people is the, the Teach for America or the Peace Corps for healthcare here in the U.S. And um, while I think we are growing as a program and coming into our own, I think that's a really helpful analogy for me for, for the work that we are trying to do in communities. And Um, Specifically, what we do is operate a two-year service fellowship program, and like some of those other programs that I mentioned, uh, we we are um, usually staffed by recent college graduates, and and so we are kind of an an entry into the workplace for a lot of young people. Um, And also like those um, organizations, we have a, a broader mission in just operating that program. So for us, Um, That includes providing some immediate human capital to organizations that are serving and have been serving for decades um, on medically underserved communities all across the state of North Carolina. Um, And it also includes helping to steward the next generation of people who are going to have medical careers that are dedicated to service. Um, And so to do that, our fellows um, spend two years working full time for amazing organizations all across the state of North Carolina, doing a mixture of some clinical work, helping to provide core primary care services uh, to community members, and also um, doing some community focused work, kind of looking at the big picture difference that primary care can make, um, not just to individual patients in their receipt of care, but entire populations and entire communities. Which is phenomenal, yes. And so you guys are in clinics all over the state, correct? Do you find that the clinics are more rural or city or that you guys kind of have a spread across the state? We have a spread across the state. We are at the beach, We uh, literally. <laughs> we are in tiny towns in the mountains. We are everywhere in between. We are in some of the biggest cities in North Carolina, in um, Raleigh and in Charlotte. And we are also in tiny towns, population 300. Um, Our bread and butter is identifying organizations that are meeting the need of a medically underserved community or population. And um, what I think is so important for people to know is that that exists all over this state. And there are very few counties and very few communities that don't have an, an organization that is addressing that need. Right. And so this is, this is really, truly also a phenomenal opportunity, not just for the communities, as you're saying that we're serving, but for the students uh, who are getting involved, because they are soon to be usually people who, correct me if I'm wrong, but are taking some time off before medical school or would like to gain some more experience before medical school. So, um, you know, for anybody who might be listening, who is serving in the medical, who wants to serve in the medical community, this is obviously a really great opportunity to consider. Um, 
So um, what do you feel like? So it's often I feel like when we hear about fellowship opportunities, they are university based and things of that nature. Um, do you think there's any real benefits of it being that AmeriCorps kind of Peace Corps program instead? Well, I think that um, the one thing that has always been really important to us, and we have close partnerships with medical schools and other health profession schools and, and universities who are um, send us great students. Um, but I think that it's been important for us to be community centered and community based. So it, it's, it's always important, for example, that although we, we do have fellows who stay at university affiliated clinics, for example, and, and we do integrate and partner with those organizations so much, that the heart of our work is community based. And um, one of the important things we're trying to share that I found, you know, as in my other life, I'm a pediatrician. And once upon a time, I was a pre-medical student who decided to take some gap years. And the only connections I had and the easy, the only job opportunities I could find were really university affiliated. Um, or large academic medical center affiliated. And so at the heart of what we're trying to do is show young people that there are these amazing organizations, sometimes in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina, that are doing fantastic work in our wonderful learning environments. And, and so I think by, by our existing in partnership, but outside of those frameworks, we really have the flexibility to to put our time and, and effort and, and work where our mission is, which is in, in highlighting the work that is done in all 100 counties in, in um, North Carolina and the, the need that exists in, in all those counties. Right, and so that need was well and present long before March slapped us all in the face, <laughs> right? So, I mean, that, that need was there. And, and we were trying to fill that void even before COVID came knocking on all of our doors and really realigned all of our lives, right? So um, obviously your fellows' roles have been probably adapting and changing with COVID. So how do you feel the program and, and your students have been faring with the pandemic? I, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. A lot of our colleagues in, um, in other service sectors who run service programs, um, they, they have probably experienced more disruption than, than MedSERP has in some ways. And, and I think it really goes back to our mission. So um, let me explain. <laughs> the, the pandemic, I think, has highlighted health disparities that have always existed. And um, the, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic and the disproportionate resources that people have to cope in a pandemic have just shown a greater light in, um, on that. And, and that is the work that our fellows are engaged in combating and, and were long before the pandemic. And so in some ways, the work that our fellows do and the service that they provide became even more important. And, and therefore, you know, that, that work continued. And, and um, one of the funny things about healthcare is healthcare is open for business. <laughs> Um, and, and we are frontline, you know, our, our fellows are frontline service workers. And, and um, in that way, their work has continued through the pandemic. And the, what they specialize in, in terms of how they address disparities is even more important. Um, and all of that said, flexibility and adaptability is always important for a MedServe fellow, but has become a daily crucial skill. And, and so I would say that while our work has continued and while our fellows service is more important than ever in what they were even doing before the pandemic, they have had to display amazing creativity in how they deliver it. So um, for example, some of our fellows who are health coaches or providing health education workshops to patients have moved all of those to a virtual format. <laughs> Um, to continue and, and help people who are not accustomed to using virtual platforms for healthcare uh, transition. And, and even more dramatically, I would say the, the pandemic has been a leadership opportunity for some of our fellows to really, really flex this, 
skills that they have as a young person and someone with an outside perspective and experience to make an impact. So several of our fellows have been really integrally involved in transitioning their clinics, for example, to telemedicine platforms um, and clinics that would have laughed at the idea months ago of, of implementing that change and, and have been able to bring their comfort with those platforms um, and, and other skills to, to play a leadership role. Um, that's also been true in fellows stepping up and taking a leadership role in COVID screening and COVID testing, um, especially those who have public health experiences and, and backgrounds. And so that's the other really special adaptation I've seen is that some, sometimes people have jumped into completely different roles or tasks, but they've, they've seen that something like a pandemic um, is, a, is a leadership opportunity moment. And because we have these fantastic fellows, um, they, they naturally fill that vacuum and, and it's created some really cool opportunities for impact that um, I don't think I would have predicted for some of our fellows a year ago when I was encouraging them to sign up for this fellowship. Yeah, and you know, I think you're so right about young people sometimes being a little bit more flexible and adaptable. And I think there are a lot of benefits to jumping into this program before their medical schooling. I think um, a lot of times we get trapped in doing things the way we're taught to do things or just the way it's always been done sometimes. And I think having kids come in at that really like still moldable stage that um, they can just think a little bit more differently, a little bit more creatively, like you're saying. And I think also their ability to transform these digital engagements is a testimony to how they're able to connect with the community. Because like you were saying, you know, we would have never really dreamed that some of these communities could have adopted these practices before this happened. We would have laughed or they would have laughed if we had said, let's introduce a virtual opportunity here. They would have been like, no one's going to be able to figure out how to use it. It's not going to work, right? And the fact that these kids have this relationship with that community to not only solve these problems, but probably to ease those worries and to allow that engagement to be a little bit more fluid uh, moving forward. So I feel like it's a, it's a testimony to their intellect and to their, you know, personal moral compass and ability to connect with people really at the end of the day. And that fact that the, the Gen Z and us millennial kids and whatnot are just seem to be a little bit more tech savvy. And I'm, I'm excited to see where those types of leadership um, experiences will, um, will move things in the future. Kids are coming up with apps and they're, they're making all sorts of fun stuff from these experiences. So I'm really excited to see hopefully what progressive natures come out of, you know, the pandemic, because it's been mostly a black hole. But like you're saying, there are these little opportunities for people to, to step up and to be engaged in this situation and to be leaders when they may have really just been told to stand in line before. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and I'll um, kind of underscore and draw out one one part of what you said about the the relationships. And I think it's, it, you, you are spot on. And it's not just relationships with the community, but it is the relationships that they build within the organizations that, that they go to. And, and that is so, so incredibly important and also a really impressive and hard learning curve to move to a brand new community. Um, some of our fellows are serving in their hometowns, but many are not. Uh, to begin work in a new field, you know, health, most of our fellows have not worked in health before and certainly not in a clinical capacity um, and to you know to make that transition for many to you know to the working world that we all make in our first jobs after college and um, and then to do that with brand new people with whom you have to develop these relationships that, it, that there are that relationship element is so crucial not just um, not just at the community level, but but also within the organizations. And so I think the pandemic has been a testament to fellow relationships across both of those spheres, and especially the fact that, um, you know, fellows are being asked to, to step up in greater leadership capacity inside of organizations as a brand new <laughs> entry-level person really speaks to their 
ability to to form those just multiple layers of of relationships and for what the pandemic can offer you know society at a larger level I think that listening and relationship development particularly with people who are different than than us who have different beliefs and viewpoints who have different life experiences is such I think a crucial skill that is needed today um, in in a world that we t- we talk about becoming increasingly polarized and um, our fellows who who have really built connections with a very diverse set of individuals um, by by making this choice to to live in a different community to to work in an organization that's not a you know a quote unquote safe choice or traditional choice for a recent college grad that they are really asking for that that challenge and and I hope that that is a contribution that that they can make um, that is way bigger than that serve. Right and I I really encourage any young person who's listening to not fear uh, leaving your hometown and like you're saying kind of being dropped and immersed in a completely different area. Um, I was kind of I was born in South Philly grew up on the Jersey waterfront very populated area and when I was 18 I went to Roanoke Virginia and I have to say it was a culture shock for me at first being (laughs) out in the woods like that in the mountains but it was beautiful and I was engaged with such a different group of people than I'd experienced most of my life and then uh, the things I'd learned um, just you don't know what you don't know that's it's just it is what it is so until you go out there and you truly um, immerse yourself in the area in the environment you just don't know what it feels like to be there and to live that lifestyle and to I think to be you don't have to leave your hometown to be a good practitioner but I do think that getting those experiences and those life experiences in general and learning about yourself too along the way they're just really important steps to make sometimes um, as you progress in your profession and it's you have to be able to also treat people very differently than yourselves and it just helps to get yourself a little bit out of your element and to maybe not fear if you know your your med serve opportunity might be an hour two hours you know three hours from where you grew up in a lot of ways that could be really exciting so i hope young people think uh, twice before they fear leaving home especially in this environment right now because i know that your organization and, and all of these offices and clinics are doing everything they can to be extremely proactive about all of our health moving forward. So, you know, don't fear, don't fear leaving kids. It can be a real big growth experience for sure. And so speaking of these clinics and of all these kids, is there any way us at home can can do more or can support this fellowship or to support the clinics that they work for? Or is there anything we can do to be helpful in this situation? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, I, I started by talking earlier about um, one of our goals is, is story sh- sharing. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, the work that many of our clinics do um, especially if they are more uh, in more rural locations, um, is is often under featured and under highlighted. And um, MedServe um, tries very hard through social media and other platforms to to tell the story of the work that fellows are doing in those places, the good things that are happening, um, and and that's true of our clinic organizations as well. And so um, I think that we we all. I would encourage us all to, to respond to the, the call to listen um, and to learn and, and to open our, our viewpoint of what different communities are, are doing and, and how valuable it is. And so um, I, I encourage you to, to check us out on our social media platforms and I encourage you to, to read those stories and, and listen and, and learn what uh, clinics are doing in Ahasky, North Carolina. Um, and and, and maybe Google <laughs> Google that place on, on a map. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, I think that the pandemic has really highlighted um, the role that, that we play in bringing resources to communities and, and in a very tactical way. We, we do that in terms of training capital resources and, and we have also during the pandemic broadened our thoughts about what those resources are. So we're conducting checks about do our clinics and our fellows have enough PPE and, and um, really, really tangible resources. And so 
I would also, if you are excited and inspired and maybe don't have the bandwidth to, to become a fellow or, or um, to, to volunteer at your local free clinic or, or community health center, then, then I encourage you to, to visit our website and, and to donate because we, we really are in, in the business of resource provision. And so any, um, any help in allowing us to provide those resources um, really multiplies now to, to 30 different counties in North Carolina that we're in. And so um, that can be a very um, simple way to, to have a big and broad um, impact in the work that we're doing. Right. And, you know, I agree 100%. Storytelling is transformative. And that is in your mission, right? It's just, it's a part of human nature. We have been doing that before we learned what mathematics were, before we said, decided what politics were, before we figured out how to farm and do things. You know, we sat around campfires and we've been telling each other stories and this is how we connect with each other. And it's one way to inspire change for sure. Um, and we can put you on the spot if you want it, but do you have any stories do you think that you would wanna to share today of your students' experiences or should we just check in on your social media platforms? Well, I encourage you to do both <laughs> um, because there are there are new fantastic stories that are that are coming out um, all all the time, and so it it is. I'm happy to share a story today, but I am also happy to 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 encourage you to continue um, reading those stories and listening. And so, one we've been talking a lot about COVID nineteen and the pandemic, but I. Um, it, the longer COVID-19 goes on, the more I'm mindful of the fact that um, that there are so many other pressing public health emergencies and crises that existed before COVID-19. And, and I have to be mindful of continuing to talk about those. And so um, one, just in that spirit, one story that that pops to mind that is a, is a pretty simple story really, but but I think highlights the beauty of bringing a young person into a place and having this goal of kind of immersive participation. Um, and, and that's the story of one of our, um, our recent alumni of the program, Chantelle McClagan, who um, is, is, uh, has lived most of her life in, in North Carolina, um, was living in kind of the, the central suburban part of the state and signed up in 2018 to go work at the Cherokee Indian Hospital in rural Western North Carolina. Com completely different <laughs> um, community uh, to the one that she was familiar with. Um, her work there, um, a significant portion of her work there was in the quality improvement, performance improvement department. Um, and one of the very quick things that and projects that she worked on was trying to build substance abuse resources and treatment centers um, there, there at the hospital for the local community. Um, and she, in, in getting into the data, was um, really moved by the degree of uh, substance abuse issues in that community, as well as the opioid epidemic that is is ravaging multiple communities, especially in Western North Carolina. And so um, what happened, what started as a quality <laughs> improvement project to, to help um, increase the number of programs available at the hospital became a, um, kind of an immersive mission experience for her. And so Chantel, um, outside of work, joined a needle exchange program um, in, in the local county she became so engaged in that work they asked her to join the board of that small nonprofit organization and um, she was was kind of working at that level to see what else could be done in addressing the the opioid epidemic in her community around the the rest of her fellowship and so um I share that not as kind of one transformative moment, but of what I really think is the beauty of MedServe, which is the investment of two years and the way in which a really thoughtful, mindful young person can see and be moved by those individual projects and that they may work on to really wrap their arms around the community and, and 
I think Chantel is a, is a fantastic role model for, for how that can be done successfully over a two year period. And I think it's a testimony to also the types of hearts and minds that you guys recruit. You know, somebody who is willing to show up and um, most of your recruits aren't just there to do a job, to clock in, to clock out. They're there to, to get involved, to try to make change, to try to think differently, to see opportunities and, and to not only um, have this role, but like you said, it can grow into these roles in the community. Now she's like a board member. So, you know, you just, you never know what you're what you're going to be able to get yourself into until you really submerse yourself. And I, I do think you're right. You know, two years makes a big difference. You know, when it's, when it's only nine months to 12 months, it's easier to lose that depth of engagement, but it takes time to build rapport and trust and to try ideas. And I think by the second year, they're really flying. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that, that, that is all really true. And I think that the phrase we use at MedServe is humble sponge. Um, and and I, I think that that's a really, it's a helpful phrase because we, as an organization and over time, we have grand ambitions for impact. And, and also so much of what we do is relationship dependent. And, and over two years, there's a lot of power in, in what can happen through those relationships. But we also recognize that we are we are putting fellows on the front lines of some of the biggest and hairiest public health crises that exist today. And, and so the, the, the way that we think about impact is, is how can you maximize the power of that two years? We don't, um, we don't expect anyone, we don't expect Chantel to go to Western North Carolina and solve the opioid epidemic, <laughs> but we expect um, her, and she's a wonderful example of someone who did go and create roots through those relationships and through that be able to be engaged in impactful work and and leave the community you know as, as richly resourced or more than it than it was before her absolutely and they obviously are so if you could give one bit of advice to any medical students looking for field experience right now, whether within your program and, and you know, you work in pediatrics yourself, right? So, you know, we can broaden the field, just uh, any bit of advice you would give to med uh, future medical students right now. Absolutely. I, I think that the most important thing that you can do early in your career is to to crystallize the vision of your purpose in this field. Medical education is such a fast paced, immersive conveyor belt, no matter what field you are in. There is a lot to learn and training happens in a very standardized way. And, and so those training programs are not the time to figure out your purpose. <laughs> um, I encourage people early in their careers to, to and try to find work and, and activities that um, that help you deepen that knowledge of what your your purpose is. Even if it's finding out that that what you thought was your purpose is, is not, <laughs> um, it, because once you are in that educational pipeline, there is so much to learn. That that I think having that purpose not only is it you know hard to do the work to figure out your purpose once you're there but but also it, it's a wonderful rudder and I, I say that as someone who didn't do a great job at that I um, although I took gap time and gap years I, I worked a typical pre-med gig and I, I sat in a cubicle and did research for two years and never touched a patient and I, I loved the work that I did and um, I'm grateful for the the gap experience that I did have but uh, but I knew even then that I wasn't doing the work that I intended to do in my clinical career. And I don't think that I recognized early in my career that that really put me behind the ball um, in having to figure that out later or, or really crystallize that later. And so what I really hope that every MedServe fellow is getting is for for individuals who are service oriented, who have a heart for rural or other underserved 
populations or communities um, that, that they can come to a fellowship like MedServe and, and see people doing the work that they eventually want to do um, and have that deeper sense and knowledge of what, what their ultimate purpose is before they head into those really busy and immersive educational experiences. Absolutely. And I encourage gap years. I took uh, two years off before I went back to graduate school, despite uh, my parents' uh, best wishes. And, you know, I really, I did not do a professional oriented job considering my, my world in nonprofit management. I painted houses. Um, and so it's funny, though, what you learn about yourself sometimes in those situations. And like you say, I wish I had, um, you know, I, maybe I wasn't as on the ball as some other people in my field because of uh, that lack of opportunity and the different role that I played out, but I didn't learn a lot. And I do know how to stain staircases, patch holes and, and paint my house now. So I feel like in some ways I have life skills that I am so grateful for that a lot of adults don't know how to do. And people are bored in COVID and looking to do projects on their house and uh, coming to me suddenly with advice for staining their coffee tables. So um, I definitely encourage um, people to not rush because graduate work at all levels is very intense. And um, sometimes when you've been pressuring yourself, a lot of us in the, the biochem world, you know, like myself, we usually tend to be sticklers. We want good grades. We always push ourselves really hard. And in a lot of ways, those gap years could seem like a negative, but in so many ways, they can be positives, whether you're like me and you're painting decks or you are one of these awesome kids who join MedServe and drop themselves into a community and get involved, you know, it's all really valuable experiences. So any kid who is wondering, should I take time off? Um, you know, listen to yourself, listen to your heart. And uh, like Anne says, you, sometimes you find your purpose more in these uh, engaged moments than you do behind the books. And that's just the truth. So if uh, I believe the deadline is coming up if you wanna be a MedServe student, right? I think uh, the deadline for the fellowship for 2021 to 23 is October 1st. So actually our application opens on October 1st and our early bird application for those of you out there who are really excited about this program and want to maximize the opportunities of getting matched with a fantastic organization, um, please submit that application by December 1st. But we realize that people make the decision about gap years at different times across the year. So we also have a main round recruitment process, an application process that um, happens in the spring and that application is due February 15th. So you have a little bit of, of time. There you go, guys. You have the holidays and a little bit of the winter stretch to, to get those applications in. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Anne, so much for talking to us today. I encourage you all listening to follow our links below. We are going to link you to the MedServe social media account. So go on and listen to those kids' stories because they're doing really incredible things. And so is Anne. So thank you again, Anne, for leading us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Morgan, for having me.